I'm Claire Edwards, and you're listening to Authentic Leadership, a series of conversations, insights, and inspirations with leaders who are real, raw, and authentic. Today, I bring you a reflective conversation with Lisa Tongalidis of Human Art, and our topic is human-centered design, or HCD, as we'll refer to it sometimes. And that's something that Lisa has been practicing way before it had a name or a label. Our conversation begins with me asking Lisa for her definition of HCD so we can demystify it. And she gives me a simple, highly memorable response. Enjoy. I met Lisa in 2018 at the premiere of the award-winning documentary, Make Me a Leader. And it was, it was just one of those instant connections where I knew we'd be staying in touch. At the time, Lisa was head of organizational development at Oceana with Canon. Today, she is the principal consultant of human art, specializing in HR consulting that helps HR teams, leaders, and career changers navigate change and uncertainty. Now, in every interaction I've had with Lisa, there's been this consistent theme of putting people first. And that's what I wanted to be in conversation with her about today, leading with human-centered design. Lisa, welcome to Authentic Leadership. Hi, Claire. Good to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's good Good to have you here. Now, it's interesting because I normally, I normally open up with some questions. Uh, you know, I'm always curious about how people came to be so passionate about their topic of conversation or something around the background. But I think because human-centered design or HCD, as we might refer to it, might not be um, as familiar a concept to everyone. I thought it might be good to start just by asking, you know, what what's your definition, philosophy, understanding of human-centered design? Mm. Yeah, it's a great question, Claire. And, I mean, I won't read out the official uh, definition because I think everyone can look that up for themselves, but the the... The principles that I use, and I guess I've always used, is this um, idea of listen, 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 observe, 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 and feel, feel, feel. And so uh, I definitely come at problems from a heart-centred point of view, um, and then I sort of translate that through to a more intellectual and um, pragmatic approach. That okay. So listen, listen, listen. Observe, observe, observe. Feel, feel, feel. What? What? Um, that that's so simple and so effective. What could that look like? In um, are you are you able to give me a, a, an example? And I know I'm throwing a curveball to you because this isn't the questions I sent through in advance. But I wasn't expecting that answer either. Um, so you know, when you when you engage with a client for the first time or a prospect or what what does what does that look like in reality? Yeah, sure. So um, basically, the the first part of um, that consulting assignment is really to understand what um, what the client's looking for in terms of their ideal future state. And to get to that ideal future state, there's a whole series of tools and practices and questions that I help them to get there because quite often we're solving problems that are actually not the real problem. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of where it all starts. And, I mean, I've experienced it myself, as I'm sure you have, Claire, is that everyone has the lightning bulb moment and think that they've got the answer, but in actual fact you need to go a little bit deeper with human-centred design to make sure that it is actually the real problem that needs to be solved. And it's kind of like that theory of um, measure twice, cut once. There's so much wasted time and effort and energy in everybody sort of running around thinking that they've got the answer when in actual fact it really is to be quiet and and to really, as I said, listen, 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 observe, 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 feel, feel, feel. Now that, you know, that, that's not rocket science, Lisa. So... I suppose my, my my question is around how come it's not embedded. I mean, any mm. you do HR consulting, HR 
consultants, their role is to understand the needs of their clients and to, you know, and to solve the real problems and to deliver the solutions to those real problems. So how come in your experience, it's not, it, it, everybody doesn't know about it. It's not embedded fully in, in organizational cultures. Yeah, I think it kind of comes back to the whole basis that we've been conditioned through the Industrial Revolution to break everything up into small parts, to over-intellectualise things, to, um, you know, refer to the smartest person in the room or the person with the highest qualifications. And I think that that thinking has its place, absolutely, But when we're sort of stepping into complexity and ambiguity and we don't know the answers, that's when human-centred design is really, really effective. Gosh, yeah, that makes absolute sense. So when did you start to see a turnaround from that, um, what you, that industrial revolution breaking down into component parts type thinking when did you start to see a a, a change Mm. I think it was very gradual for me because I think that's just my natural innate way of being so in a sense I've been fighting that old system because my sense making approach and my design approach has always used human-centered design even before it was a thing um so when, when I started to learn about it, I went, oh, wow, this is great. This is who I am. So it just made um, perfect sense for me to wrap my arms around it and centre my business around it. But um, where I sort of the rubber hit the road for me is that I was um, building some relationships with a few data scientists um, at, at Canon in my last role and um, – as we started to explore things like digital literacy and how we were going to upskill the business around um, technology and things like that, it just sort of came to to light that we both use the same approach. Um, And so it was really validating in so many ways because I think when we, when we talk to people who are quite advanced in that space, and I'm certainly not an expert, um, there's some very, very similar thinking patterns in, in the way that they would approach um, problems. And, and obviously all of that is um, skyrocketing in businesses. But if you if you leave the human part behind, you know, it just doesn't make sense from my point of view because you actually have to have the skill to understand and leverage all of the digital tools that are available to us to, to use them effectively. Yeah. And I know this is completely... Um aside but you just reminded me of um, a a documentary I saw about coding um, of apps and how male oriented it is and was from the very beginning Mm. Um, all male engineers who who did that coding so I I just smiled when you were talking about um, digital literacy and uh, and, and the and the design scientists. Mm. And the beautiful thing is, is all of this stuff is being taught to kids in school. So if you're close to your kids' um, curriculum, you'll see that design thinking is quite um, embedded in the in the Australia's national school curriculum. Yeah. So you you're looking into an organisation. Um, what what are some of the things that you're seeing? that's giving you evidence that they're using HCD as a practice or a philosophy or an approach? Mm. I think um, I've, I've seen it being done really, really well and then I've sort of seen it in a more mechanical sense where the business has, um, you know, it's just starting to sort of learn how, how to use it. So, um but when I was at eye care, uh, they were using human centered design for the redesign of the um, uh, New South Wales workers' compensation scheme. And so that's where I saw it really come to life because there were people who were deeply practiced in human centered design. So I felt like, 
you know, I was a pig in mud there. But when I've gone into other businesses. Um, <laughs> Call it a pig in poo. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but the, the difference is, I guess, when you're in an organisation that hasn't really wrapped their arms around it, it, it's like anything, you know, you have to kind of unlearn and relearn because yeah. all of those sort of natural go-to processes and ways of working, ways of thinking, um, in some instances, are just no longer fit for purpose. So it's really about stepping them through the concept and the tools. And one of the best um, mental models that I, I think, you know, a lot of people might know about it is called the Kinevan Framework. Basically just sort of outlines um, different different approaches to thinking and solving problems. And um, I would really encourage people to take a look at that because every time I sort of size up um, a consulting gig or work with a, uh, a coachee in, in career design, so, some things are really simple and straightforward, other things are more sort of complicated and then we start getting more into the complex space. Mm-hmm. So that sort of uh, fear of the unknown comes up and everyone sort of tries to um, lock down and, you know, stick to their knitting and, and do what they've always done. And so it's it's helping them to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and to use different tools and ask different questions to explore this discomfort that they're feeling And when it's done collectively and it's a co-creation process where there's no egos, there's no hierarchy, it's amazing just the sorts of results that you can get from the team. And the team really does have the knowledge and wisdom to solve these problems, but they don't necessarily understand human-centred design as as a tool. And there's just a myriad of different tools and practices out there. So it just depends on the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, which ones we might use. Yeah. Well, we've got myriad opportunities at the moment in we this uh, in this super world, haven't we? Um, I, I'm not sure if it's possible. I just wanted to go back to what, what you were saying when you were at eye care. Are you able to share at a high level any of a, a project that went through that HCD process that had some really good outcomes or... Am I asking too much? (laughs) No, no, absolutely. I'm sure they wouldn't mind. Um, So most people are familiar with uh, workers' compensation in terms of a concept and uh, it sometimes is one of those topics that, you know, gives people shivers up their spine. And uh, it it, it was a very, it is a very adversarial type of process where you have to kind of prove that you've been injured or Mm. things like that in the workplace. And so this new design, this new concept is all uh, that eye care was embracing uh, when I was there is this um, empathy-based approach to to injured workers. And the whole idea is that we trust that if something happened to you, then it happened to you. And so we're going to accelerate that claim and not put you through all the sort of hoops and barrels to to get you back to work. And it's still in its implementation phase because it's kind of hard to land something so different to what the previous system was. But um, the, the proof points around getting people back to work and being an agent in their own recovery are just phenomenal. So it really mm. does work at scale and at a micro level. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So in terms of if we if we sort of take a parallel um, direction and go to go to leadership. So what um, as a leadership practice, as a leadership philosophy, what what are some of the things that leaders could look to do to develop human centered design as a as a capability or or as a practice for themselves how can it work in leadership yeah that's a great question claire and um again this is a real challenge for 21st century leaders um we've you've probably heard and and I'm sure most of your listeners have heard around this need to develop empathy as a core leadership skill 
And human-centred design just doesn't happen unless you have the capability and capacity to be, you know, to, to be empathetic to your people. And so, you know, that's that's almost like a muscle that all leaders have had to step into and learn, particularly through COVID. So the foundations are there. And this other next step is really about building trust and letting go of some of those sort of command and control behaviours. If if that's not in place, it makes it very, very difficult to use human-centred design principles uh, yeah. effectively. You, you can do it but you don't get the breakthroughs unless the trust and empathy is there. So what I'm hearing is it has to be, um, for, for it to be successful, it has to be part, uh, really part of the culture, part of the DNA, leadership, people development, HR, everywhere in the organisation. So it's not like, okay, we're going to develop this project on, uh, for, on an HCD principle um, and you then have a leader who's not listening and and barking yes. out orders that just can't yes. work. It's it's not something that you sort of dust off the shelf and do a course on. It's actually doing it in the flow of work. So learning mm. together, feeling comfortable to experiment, feeling comfortable to share your views. If the culture doesn't really support that, then it's going to make the human-centred design process not very sticky. And I've, I've seen situations where... You know, some people are very cynical or they think, you know, it's a bit childish and you just you just don't get the cut through unless everyone's on the same page and yeah. really interested in solving the problem on a human level because we are human, we're not machines. <laughs> um, it just doesn't work. I mean, have, do, you, do you get feedback that if people think it's a fluffy process or a soft process or...? Uh, less so, less so these days. I think it's well accepted. And now that we've got language and tools and processes to talk about it, it, it ceases to be a concept. It's, mm. it is real, but it's still associated with, um, you know, the creatives and the marketing team and, you know, and, and obviously IT uses human centered design in many cases. And in, in the corporate space, it's almost seen to be, oh, no, we don't do that in HR or we don't do that in finance because we're finance or because we're HR. And what it really does is it just sort of gets underneath the skin of titles or, you know, what is that function all yeah. about? And it just comes back to we're here to serve the employees who deliver our products and services to our clients or customers. And when you see your role through that lens it changes everything. Yeah. I remember when we had a chat last week, there was something you said about, you know, we, we, we've, got to, we've got to ensure that our learning serves the learner. And if we always have that in position, and, uh, and I, my first experience of something that's similar to HCD was um, becoming accredited in something called brain-friendly learning. And I, it, was, it was really interesting because I thought I was learner focused you know I thought uh, what what more can I learn oh boy <laughs> yeah, there's a lot more the lot more the that you can learn um I, I wanted to go back to empathy hmm. because uh, and I'm just curious and again a bit of a curveball question but um I mean how do you go about coaching someone in developing empathy I'm assuming it can be learned yeah absolutely Claire um a lot of it's just around self-awareness um and you know again most of us are conditioned to focus on ourselves and satisfying our own needs and that's absolutely critical and important for survival um but when we when we step into our, our well, any role basically, it could be a parent, could be in the workplace, we're no longer serving ourselves. We're actually serving customers and each other. And for a lot of people and even for a lot of organisations, it's just not a practice that is inculcated in their culture. Mm. But when, when especially like lots of businesses want to be high-performing or they call themselves high-performing organisations, um, the only way they can be high, high performing is 
if they've got self-aware leaders and people, they practice the skills of learning, listening, observing others, because that, that's often the, the stumbling block. And then the next piece is being curious about your environment or your context so that you really embrace the problem that needs to be solved mm. rather than just looking at serving your own needs. Mm. And and so do you think, let, let's take sort of the past 18 months and, and what's happened with with the pandemic, with people very quickly having to adapt to change, um, working from home and and the challenges and opportunities that that brought and, you know, the the great resignation and uh, sea changes, all, all that sort of stuff happening. Mm-hmm. Do, do you think that's uh, facilitating some form of acceleration in human-centered focus and those who don't will lose out or what what are your thoughts on that Lisa? Mm. Well I think the pandemic's affected different industries and and people differently so there'll always be a school of thought in my view who is very fearful of change and and we've certainly seen that throughout the pandemic and they're the sort of people who will just hunker down and just wait for Uh, they're all clear and then they'll go back to the way that they were before and that's where they'll feel safe. But for those people who are brave enough and have experienced enough turmoil and dissent, I suppose, throughout the COVID um, period, I think, you know, those who are self-aware or becoming self-aware are really leaning into this space because Mm. they've had time to reflect and it's it's kind of it's it's as sort of clear as a nose on your face, really. But but if you're not paying attention to it, you're never going to see it. So um, I, I would really encourage people to read up about it. There's some fantastic resources online, um, and because it's an innate human skill that we learn when we're children, you can go back to be yeah. thinking about that as an adult, and and you know not be a child, which is where a lot of the conflict comes around in using human-centred design because people think it's all a bit childish. Um, but it's just shown and proven time and time again as heaps of university studies and, um, you know, th- things that are, you know, embedded now in MBAs and executive mm. programs that really prove the uh, effectiveness and the speed in which a business can um solve problems by using yeah. human centered design. Yeah, and and, and it it does it does still have a, a long way to go and it, 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 you know on the on that surface level it certainly isn't rocket science. I know I had an experience um last week with a call center and all all I got in response was well this is the policy. And and mm-hmm. I'm like but I just I'd just really like you to fix my problem, please. But they weren't empowered. The that call call center rep mm. had just had their hands tied as to well, I can't I can't help. So I would think an HCD approach would be a more empowering approach for people to make decisions um, within a, a boundary of risk. Absolutely, and again, there's there's many proof points um, in you know, literature or online. Uh, I, I look at so many that I can't really reference one off the top of my head, but um, the level of engagement and um, enablement and empowerment that the, uh, you know, frontline people feel when a human-centred design approach is used is just incredible. Mm. Like this, this is uh, really, really critical right now with, as you say, the um, great resignation and retention and you know p- people people will just leave their organizations if they're not supported but yeah. it's not about giving them lots of things it is really about opening up um, you know the dialogue with them listening to them observing what their needs are because they're all very different now um, yeah. and, and you know thanks to COVID and so those conversations are the most important things in reshaping an organisational's culture um, and, and helping to sort of retain top talent. Yeah, and I'm thinking back to, because we were talking about 
call centers when I took over a call center and just sat and sort of met with all the teams and, and all the supervisors. And I realized that if I could just start by fixing the dripping taps and the squeaky hinges, mm. they didn't they didn't want the bells and whistles. They wanted their problems and issues to be fixed. They wanted to be able to do their work um, in the easiest way possible. So, And they were the ones who had the solutions to the problems too. You don't need to bring in a ton of, bunch of consultants in. Yeah, absolutely. You've just got to ask your team. They're the ones on yeah. the tools. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's less about training and more about facilitating. So, so helping people to discover what they already know. And when you've got that clarity, as we all know, when we've got clear thinking in the room or in our own heads, it's just almost magical. Like the answers just appear from nowhere. And, and that's a key principle of um, social cognitive neuroscience, neuroscience of learning. We, if, if, mm. if we tell somebody something that they already know, then the brain just says, yeah, no, been there, done that, got that. But if we draw out, you know, the, the root, the, the Latin root of education, educare, is to draw out. So if we can draw out of people that which they already know, and then help layer on what's new, what's different, what might be more complex or sophisticated, then they're going to run with it rather than just sit and being told, you know, trained. I actually mm -hmm. do have a little bit of a, an aversion to the to the word training because in my head you train dogs and horses and, and not people. <laughs> mm. Oh, no, I agree. I, I, con I constantly pick myself up on and letting go of the word training and, and turn it into learning because – you know, training sort of almost seems like an event, whereas learning happens every day, every second, every moment. But if you're not paying attention, um, you're just going to go back to yeah. those tried and tested ways of working. And so, you know, it really kind of comes down to to mindset. If, if you're not willing to shift your mindset, it's going to be very hard yeah. for you to wrap your arms around yeah. human-centred design. Yeah, and it's about making that innate conscious. Let's bring it up to a conscious practice. Yes, absolutely. So I, um, you're now a principal consultant with Human Art. I love the name of your business. So can you tell us a little bit more? What's, what occupies your days and your passion these days after having left or escaped from corporate? <laughs> Well, I don't think I've really escaped, but the dynamic and the relationships changed, Claire. Um, and but 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 I like that idea. I would like to escape to the chateau, perhaps, <laughs> maybe. Um, but look, it's 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 almost been a bit serendipitous for me because I guess uh, you know I was really and and still am very very passionate about human centered design and. I do think of individuals as works of art in progress, which um, I guess even maybe five or ten years ago, you know, if I'd shared that in a corporate environment, yeah. people would have thought I'd lost, you know, lost my mind. So I had to be very careful and quite conservative about um, that use of language. But I think now people are really up for it yeah. because... That you know, you can't ignore the complexity. The complexity has actually always been there, but we like to kid ourselves and pretend that everything's really simple and easy. And you know, everyone just kind of gets into a room and brainstorms, and then the tasks are allocated, and off we go. But we all know, like the great McKinsey um, statement, which I still have yet to see. Where, where, who are the organisations that are thirty percent? Um, successful yes. with their change processes. So I'm like, I'm not going to worry about the 70% who fail. I'm going to look at the ones who who are actually successful. And what are their practices? How do they work? Because I don't want to follow the fails. I want to follow the successes. So, you know, I really spent quite a lot of time immersing myself and um, doing lots of research around forward-thinking companies. And, you um, I guess my skill is to kind of uh, absorb and embody those learnings, combine it with the human-centred design practices, and then take that to the organisations, 
fundamentally that I left or, or organisations in that space to bring them up to to a level where they can actually step into this 21st century uh, world. And because I've been there, I know how painful change can be. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can understand and empathise how difficult it is for those businesses to go through that change. But, you know, it all starts with one step and and that's that's that whole idea of you have to recognise you've got a problem before you can fix it. Yeah. So you're giving back. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's been so joyful, really. And and as much as I know COVID's been a very difficult thing for all of us, including myself, I, I immediately sort of recognised this is an opportunity for a huge shift in, um, you know, society and, and corporate yeah. practice. So I, I want to be part of that. And so I just love it. I just love it. And the conversations and the um, clients that I'm working with are really embracing it. So it's it's all it's all human centered design. So it's somewhat experimental. But as as we work together and co create, we're mm. actually coming up with really exciting outcomes that you know wouldn't have been thought possible. Um, you know, even just a few years ago. And the joy really is, is that the team solves the problem themselves. It's not me yeah. coming in with a solution. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. An exciting journey. It is. It's so much fun. It's been a bit scary, but, you know, you've got to, got to get out there, you've got to get into it. That's what's living. That's what living is all about. Oh, there's, a, there's always so much energy in learning when we push ourselves outside of our comfort zone. Oh, Absolutely. Right? Oh, Lisa, what a fascinating conversation. What I'll do is find out some of those um, resources that are available and I'll put those on the show notes, you know, maybe a couple of um, really good websites that people could access or a, a decent book or something like that. But but sort of to to wrap things up, I think if, you know, if we had either emerging or established leaders listening to this podcast or absolutely anyone for that matter, if there was one key message that you could leave listeners with around the essence of human-centered design, what what might that be? I think it goes back to what I was saying before, um, Claire. It is listen, 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 observe, 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 feel, feel, feel. Um, and they're all sensory experiences yeah. so if you're not in touch with those senses which a lot of us are not get back out into nature get connected with people on, on a really really personal level because that's how it feels um, to step into the human-centered design mindset when you're when you're there that's that's when the real work can can happen and uh, I'm just going to bolt on another little question to this having listened to you do you think this is more difficult now that for many of us we're still connecting online rather than face to face or is is that an excuse no quite the opposite so I I've kind of stepped into lifting my own tech technical skills and I use tools like Miro and Mural uh, for online collaboration, it's it is a bit challenging at first, but um, all of the workshops that I've facilitated today, which is, have used human centered design, have all been online. So you can definitely shift uh, without being in the room. Mm. That's good to hear. There is hope. <laughs> oh no, absolutely. In fact, sometimes I think it's more effective so I, I I was very anti doing it um online when I first started because what I really love to do is be very tactile and get my post-it notes out and flip charts and all that sort of stuff but but using those tools like Miro and Mural which is basically like a shared whiteboard um mm. you can basically recreate that situation and because you can use things like breakout rooms and what have you people People actually like it. It's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's very simple to use. Yes, I uh, it's it's been an interesting journey for me as well to um, to embrace that change because I had probably a little bit of a fixed mindset around 
uh, face to face is better than than online. But then having been forced into these online relationships, then realizing that actually there are some benefits that that we wouldn't have face to face in terms of what you're saying about the breakout rooms. There seems to be some a, a deeper levels of sharing um, and more and and more spontaneity. And um, somebody who I'm going to be in conversation with for a future podcast um, who runs a change management boutique I, I did a course with and it was all you know on HCD principles and I just I just felt so validated um, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah it, it, uh, and my sense of status was enhanced through learning with these principles and even though I use them myself you know to someone who's aware of it if it can make a big difference to them Mm. somebody who isn't aware of it it can make an even greater difference so Mm. exactly exactly I was was just thinking about uh, a recent resource which I really really like because it brings um, the concept of psychological safety and human-centered design together which which is fundamental is um, there's a whole range of, of great tools and practices online um, from Leader Factor. So Dr. Tim Clark uh, from America, he, le- he leads um, a consulting practice, a global consulting practice, upskilling leaders in psychological safety. And, and one of the consequences of embracing and learning about psychological safety is that it creates the safety that people need yeah. to have to start yeah. exploring themselves and others and their context, which, again, you know, it's an enabler of human-centred design. Absolutely. And actually I'm uh, going to be uh, in conversation with someone who's um, now a, um, a global expert in psychological safety, so we've got some some really good stuff coming up. Yeah. Oh, Elisa, what, what a- you can see all the paths converging. Yeah, I know you? it is. It's really it's really exciting. There's um, yes, just to to be a part of it, to observe, and to feel. <laughs> Thank you for the yes. reminder. Yes. Uh, finally. Um, in terms of people being able to to connect with you, are you happy for me to put your website and your your LinkedIn contacts on the show notes? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you. And we'll get those resources on there as well. Lisa, it's always a joy to catch up with you. I always feel richer for the experience of being in conversation. And I'm so glad um, that we... Uh, bumped into or had the courage to chat with each other at that at, at the premiere of that documentary I'm I'm all the better for for knowing you and for learning with you so thank you oh uh, it was meant to be clear <laughs> it certainly was go well stay safe thank you thanks for listening and we hope that this conversation provided some food for thought if you enjoyed the podcast please head over to Apple Tunes or Google Podcasts and give us a positive rating and write a short review. This is the most effective way for us to get the key messages around 21st century leadership out to the community. Go well and stay safe.